On this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, we are talking all things monsters, how to design monsters that are interesting and engaging for your players, and give them clues as to how to defeat your maleficent foes. All that and more coming up right now. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast. My name is Ben Byrne and I am here as always every week with James Hake, Dale Kingsmill, Sean Merwin. Sean, when playing a game of D&D or, or some other tabletop role playing game, what is the most evil thing one of your characters has done and or gotten away with? Oh, I, I don't really play evil characters all that much so probably the typical stealing from your own party uh (laughs) but it's generally for a good reason probably someone deserves to have their things taken from them right you're like the mediator when that when there are other evil party members you're just bringing justice to the world exactly exactly let's call it justice (laughs) okay dale kingsmill are you a, a paragon of justice or have you played evil characters before Kind of neither. I don't think I've ever done anything evil as a, as a player character, but I definitely have, like, my my first uh, Pathfinder character was built to be a coward, so I just okay. straight up never helped in combat. Um, so that's maybe the closest I get is letting my friends die. Um, <laughs> yeah, okay, cowardice is, is yeah. a form of Inaction evil, Inaction is a kind of evil, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, you know. Uh, James, what about you? What is the evilest thing your character may have done in a game of D&D? Oh, I am a DM collaborator with evil characters. Uh, <laughs> in my very first game of D&D ever, uh, that I ever ran, I should say, in high school, um, I had a party member who wanted to play uh, someone who would betray the party. Um, and it happened after they kind of discovered that their family were the baddies and they were like okay well actually i think family matters over all things so uh I, I am going to betray them in the last act and i i orchestrated a gigantic final battle with that character and their sort of bonded shield guardian golem and a bunch of reanimated zombies in in a volcano uh so i think i made things as over the top evil as i possibly could uh, for them in that moment <laughs> I've always wanted to do something like that, but I've always had players that have been a little bit uh, trepid to to be the betrayer just because, you know, you don't want to have sore feelings at the end of a campaign, which is fair enough. Um, and later today, we might touch on how to approach doing evil campaigns, if that's something that you want to try with your party. Uh, but before we get there, let us jump into our first topic discussion for today. Sean, I wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about the Monster Grimoire, but not super specifically the Monster Grimoire because we're still holding uh, a couple secrets back from that, but it's no secret that you've been working for the last couple months on the Monster Grimoire. And so I suppose I wanted to ask you uh, and everybody else here kind of the approach to creating monsters. Uh, You know, where do you start? What are you looking for? What makes a good monster? And this might not just be in the context of of creating it for a book or a codex or something like that, but also creating it for a campaign. Or if you're running a game, what makes a good homebrew monster? How do you tweak monsters? I'm just going to ask every monster-related question I can think (laughs) of uh, and then ask you to answer them all. So uh, I suppose just the the thing that I'm curious about is as a dungeon master, I always it's very easy for me to come up with monsters, usually because it's informed by the situation, right? They're going down into a cave. I need a cave dwelling monster. Let me grab, you know, this kind of cave trolley thing and I'll end up, you know, homebrewing an element of it. Or they're in a volcano. I need some sort of elemental or whatever it happens to be. The situation usually informs the sort of monster I'm creating. You've been working on a codex, a grimoire of monsters. What's the approach when you kind of don't have you know, a, a campaign that you're running or an automatic narrative that you're you're trying to run to, to creating something from scratch? I think the first step is to remember that monsters play a lot of different roles within the game. Mm. Uh, they, they are story elements. They are mechanical elements. Uh, they are foils that, for which uh, the characters will smash up against. And smash up against in many ways, and narratively, uh, mechanically, and and across the spectrum. So you want to make sure that whatever monster you're doing uh, or creating, that they're good at one of those things, and hopefully good at all of those things. 
So yeah. if if you want your monster to tell a story just by its very existence, uh, as a DM, you should be able to read a monster's stat block and story and say, all right, I know where this monster belongs in the world and in an adventure. Mm. And then you can, from there, play against that type and use them in a lot of different ways. But you want them to have that place uh, within the game and within your world. So it's sort of about like how you want the monster to challenge the party as well, whether you want it to be like an intellectual challenge. You know, this monster may not be a physical threat, but it poses some other sort of threat or, um, you know, do you think thematically about monsters a lot? What do I want this monster? What, what sort of campaign can I envisage this monster being within? Yeah, yeah, you can. Um, for In terms of where the monster fits in, in terms of the game, um, fourth edition did a very interesting thing by naming monster types, lurkers and soldiers and brutes. Right. And yeah. and right there, you as the DM understand that you don't want to put the lurkers, you know, in a row between the big bad guy and the players. That's not their role. You want the soldiers there, and the brutes are the ones that are going to come out and attack. And so, right there, D and D did a great job of letting DMs know where these monsters fit in, in terms of tactics. And, and then uh, you can play off of those types as well, making leaders out of a brute or leaders out of a lurker. And there are different ways in which you can do that as well. Fifth edition didn't carry that over, but the remnants of that hierarchy of monsters is still fresh in many people's minds. Did you keep that in your mind when you were designing for the Monster Grimoire? And is it important when you're designing, and I know you have to, you might have to speak around some of your specific designs here, um, but when you're designing, are you trying, for, for a book, are you trying to get a balance of, all right, I've got 20 monsters that are really brutish, I need to come up with another, you know, 20 that aren't so much to, you know, I've only got five that are lurkers, Let, let's, you know, devise some more lurker monsters to kind of balance the book out? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with the Grim Hollow Monster Grimoire being a horror, dark fantasy book, not only did we have to do that, but we also had to figure out where those sorts of archetypes fit within the realm of dark fantasy and horror. Sure. So you want a lurker, but you also want a lurker that lurks in the shadows and maybe has some mind altering abilities that throw people off so not only are they lurkers but they can actually come out into public but still be lurkers or maybe there there are monsters that actually grow on the characters that the characters are unaware of so they are lurking in plain sight until yeah. that fateful moment when the lurker decides to strike or is found out and is forced to strike yeah, let, let, uh, not to give too much away, but there are some disgusting artworks <laughs> inside the, mm. the Monster Grimoire coming along the lines of what you've just mentioned. Uh, James, having designed monsters for the Fables and obviously other projects before that as well, is your approach, I would imagine, a little bit closer to what I was describing before in terms of you have a specific need for a specific type of monster within the adventure at, at specific moments as you're writing the, the story? Yeah, I guess you could put it that way. I mean, the fantasy I grew up reading were things like The Hobbit and watching shows like Pokemon and Buffy and things that uh, I think all in all have a sort of monster of the week like mm. structure to it. Um, and what that structure, you know, that episodic structure lends itself really well to is building a story around a creature. Uh, the and when you do that, the creature really has to hold its own. You can't just have uh, a, a bunch of boring little minions uh, when you do a monster of the week sort of story like that. You have to have something that's, that's interesting and unique and that the characters haven't seen before and that has a certain level of, of narrative weight to it. Without this monster, this story wouldn't be happening. Um, and it could be a big dumb idiot. It could be a monster that just wants to eat some big ooze that wants to like slurp everything up. Or you know, it could be a criminal mastermind vampire. There's a lot of latitude in what you do, what you can do with creatures like this. There is a tension, however, in D&D &D between 
large, singular, load-bearing monsters and interesting combat encounters. Uh, the action economy uh, swings poorly in the Mastermind's favor when there's one of them and four or five of the heroes. And there's kind of a game concession that we have to make for a fun and fair fight by kind of giving them minions to play around with that probably don't have a lot to do with the story that's going on, but are, are there to fill a need in a mechanical sense. The very best adventures find a way to do it all, right? You know, maybe the goblin minions that the uh, unchained ooze is mind controlling or something. Uh, have personalities and you've heard about them in the dungeon or you met them before they got mind controlled and you have a little bit of a uh, character sympathy for these poor, poor goblins that now you must fight in a non-lethal manner in the boss fight, right? That That's kind of the 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 cooking with gas version of an encounter that otherwise just kind of has mechanical stakes rather than narrative ones. Mm. Um, if you're writing an adventure for publication... I think that's the sort of thing you ought to think about. But when you're just kind of running your weekly game, that's a that's a lot of uh, that's a, that's a lot of effort to put into your game uh, every single week, and it's it's a lot of effort to actually run. It takes a lot of just like energy at the table, let alone prep time. Mm. Um, so I think there there's a balance that must be struck. You know, if you've got a magnum opus boss fight, don't don't try and do that every week. You'll burn yourself out. It's mm. okay to have some episodes that aren't, you know, season finale tier in your game. It's why I like spiders is because spiders are often what I what I refer to as like a palate cleanser. And huh. uh, it's kind of like, you know, here's this uh, big boss fight or it's a morally complex kind of fight or the party find out that they should feel bad for killing the monster at the end for whatever reason or they, they have to pull their punches and they can't do lethal damage because the the, the minions are being mind controlled and then a session or two later I'm like, yeah, spiders, you know, or zombies <laughs> or whatever, like just something yeah. for them to trash and not feel bad about it. Yeah, Colville made a video about that recently. Matthew Colville made a video sort of saying everyone likes zombies. You need something in your game that is like a zombie zombie that you don't have to feel guilty about killing just give sure. them some kind of faction or beast that it's like it can die it's okay are you mm -hmm. drawing a lot from mythology for your own games uh dale or is that something that is that a bit am i stereotyping you there am i putting you in a box as the mythology person um i mean i'm sure that i do i think it, it just makes up such a such a you know dense part of my personal tapestry of like knowledge mm. that i I can't help but draw from it. I also believe, I mean, I, I did an article for the Ghostfire, I, for, for the Ghostfire Gaming blog, um, you can find an article I wrote um, talking about how um, stories of the past can never really be left behind. And and mm. the, the tropes and ideas that we see there come up time and time again. So that even if I don't realize that I'm doing it, there's no way that I'm not doing it. I absolutely am pulling from those things all the time. But for me, primacy when when planning monsters for my adventure is always I have I'm so finicky about coherence. I really want it all to feel like it's all part of the same adventure. In, in like a bit, like I have no doubt that it's just as fun to play a style of game where you're like, you're in a dungeon. In this room are skeletons. In this next room are bats. And in the, and then finally, you know, like, and having them all not be related at all. That sounds really fun, but I could never run that game. I, I would enjoy playing it. I would never be able to run it because that would drive me up the wall. Um, yeah, I don't know. I remember like one of my earliest, uh, games that I ran was uh was Hollow's Last Hope, which is a Pathfinder uh adventure. It's just a really short one, really easy sort of starter um adventure for people where it's like the town has a plague and you have to go and get the ingredients in order to cure the plague. And I was like, great, fun. But somehow it ends up being it's got kobolds and it's got um a warg and it's got spiders and it's got and ev all these like like 10 different beasties that aren't related to the the ingredients in any way and I just couldn't help it I had to get my fingers in and completely rewrite every monster that you encounter in the entire adventure because I was like no let's narrow this down let's make it kobolds <laughs> mm. and like did everything on a kobold theme and occasionally like you might have an environmental 
uh, difference or whatever. I, it wasn't like they were fighting kobolds every single time, but I was like, let's at least theme the monsters. Let's get some reptilian stuff going on and keep it there. I'm just curious, Sean, whether whether the process of designing a monster changes when you're, you know, um, pitching it for other people in games that you're not planning yourself. Yeah, I don't think the process changes all that much. There may be a couple extra steps to the process. So if you're running a home campaign and you're just making up your own monster, you can do anything you want that will fit nicely into the adventure that you're that you're creating. When you have to use it in a published adventure or you're publishing the monster for wide usage, you want to make sure that the monster will fit into multiple situations. So for example, I received an adventure where a writer created a monster that basically was only effective while in a waterfall. Now, this could be a cool monster for a very specific adventure, but if you put it into a monster book, you are limiting the use of that monster to a very, very limited set of circumstances. It's like, why is everyone running encounters near waterfalls now? Hmm, why could that be? Well, it's because there's this cool monster. So you have to then step back and say, how can we make this monster more useful to a wider variety uh, of, of encounters and adventures. And that's not to say you can't have those kinds of monsters, but you don't want, say, 410 monsters that can only be used in very specific situations. I, I want to jump in on that point because uh, I really like monsters that have very specific weaknesses like this. It's very mythological of it, right? Mm. Uh, you know, vampires have their specific weaknesses and stuff like that, and they're very, they're very fun to fight because there's a there's an almost puzzle like element to it. They're more than just kind of hit it till it dies. Um, but I also agree with you, Sean. When you're writing a D and D monster, you want to get a lot of bang for your buck out of it. Uh, I, I'm I'm sure that whenever a big RPG publisher includes a new monster in one of their campaigns, they want to also be able to put it in a monster book one or two years down the line next time they do it. Um, if you are a person who is in this situation, and I realize that's a, that's a vanishingly small part of our audience, but if, if you happen to be in this strange situation, um, I think the, the way I would tackle it is to create a relatively very strong monster that does not have a weakness baked into its stat block and then in the text of the adventure itself talk about this specific creature's weakness and how you know this this being can only you know is immune to all damage or does double damage while it is within the waterfall lair that it contains mm -hmm. um and and then you have a you know you've got a big powerful scary monster that you can have everyone use in their adventure and you also have your very unique sort of puzzle focused mythological ish uh monster of the week encounter that you've got right here for this story Mm. I I like that you that you bring up weaknesses because uh, you know f from time to time if I'm trying to make a combat encounter feel like it's a bigger deal, I often will build in what I keep referring to as the uh, Death Star exhaust port. <laughs> like you know, there's got to be that one thing that the players can do that will just kill the monster. It's hard to do. But it's there, and I like I like sort of baking that in and making the combat encounter, like you say, almost a puzzle where it has these phases. And maybe this will come up in a future article that might be coming out on the Ghostfire Gaming blog. Um, but <laughs> the idea of these phases of combat where you're learning things, and then you figure out, oh, if we do this, it'll die. Mm -hmm. um, and and sort of and of course you can't do that with every monster. It's it's like what Sean is saying. You know, you can't you can't have every single monster in the monster manual. <laughs> die by Death Star exhaust port. You can't, you know, stake to the heart, can't automatically kill every single thing that you face. Um, but when you do have monsters like that, for some reason, for me, it makes the combat feel like it's a bigger deal. It makes mm. it feel bigger, more, Im more important. It, well, it, it is, you know, sorry, go ahead, Sean. It is, it is great. Those puzzle monsters are really fun and making them epic and having the, the players learn over time, there's those secrets. That's that's great. That's great fun for many many players and many DMs. the The tricky part is how to dole out that information, because if if you oh you you attack the monster, you're not doing anything. One round goes by, and then oh, it's the big reveal. All you have to do is hit them with the blessed uh, crossbow bolt, and they die. 
that's anticlimactic. Whereas if you go on for too long, the players get frustrated. They're not learning fast enough. So that it's hard to create a puzzle monster that automatically delivers the correct information in the correct time sequence in the optimal way. That's really a DM and party sort of uh, knob that needs to be dialed. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's also trickier if you're bound to, I mean, the rules. Does that make sense? Like, like if you're strictly following the rules of 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, it becomes harder to, to build that stuff in. Whereas if you get a little more loosey-goosey with it, if you start using action-oriented monsters, you can say, oh, well, this is going to happen in round three. And hopefully that will flag this piece of information. You know, mm -hmm. um, you you can you can build those things in as soon as you start messing with the rules, which is harder when you're publishing material. But when mm, you're in your but... home game, see, this is I get to be free with whatever I do because I'm like I am in control of the world, and I say that this happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's another way to do this too, um, and to, to it's to create a Death Star weak point that doesn't quite involve a puzzle. Um, I'm going to draw from the original Legend of Zelda for the NES uh, back in the 1980s. Um, the final boss, the very first time Ganon, the big blue pig monster, uh, appears in the game. You learn through cryptic hints that his only weakness is the silver arrow. Um, and he can only be killed with a silver arrow. And eventually in his dungeon you find the silver arrow. That's part of the explorations you need to find the thing that will kill him. But when you enter the boss fight, you'll find that he is, is immune to the Silver Arrow. Um, and because it's a game from the 1980s, it's not exactly clear why. I think if the game were made now, you know, he'd have this cool, like, parry animation where he, like, knocks the arrow away and it's like, ha ha ha, I, I am much too quick for you or something like that. Um, but the, the way this fight goes is he's kind of warping around or turning invisible and appearing throughout the room. And you, you, know, you just kind of have to hit him with your sword whenever he appears. But then once you've hit him enough, uh, his color will change and he'll linger for longer. And that is the game's clue to you. Oh, he's vulnerable, hit him with the arrow. You hit him with the arrow once and he crumbles into dust, game over, you win. Good work. Um, I think it's it's a perfectly valid option to get that sort of narrative punch of the cool one-shot kill without having all the sort of like information dissemination problems of a puzzle monster by just saying uh, this monster doesn't die when it hits zero hit points it becomes vulnerable to its to its ultimate weakness and if it isn't hit with that uh, by the start of its next turn it regains you know 20 hit points a quarter of its hit points uh, and then the fight keeps going. And so they have to they have to figure out what's going on along the way. And you can be really, really obvious with this. You can mm -hmm. say, it's the silver arrows. And that means the puzzle isn't figuring out what the weakness is. The puzzle is, okay, when and how do we use this weakness? Mm -hmm. mm. And yeah. that also stops it from being a literal one-shot kill, which <laughs> I think, I think yeah. would be anticlimactic. I accidentally did that. I... I I don't know if anyone's played XCOM, the, the remakes yeah. of XCOM, Enemy Unknown. Yeah. Um, on my first playthrough of Enemy Unknown, I got the whole way through, I got to the final room, these bosses appear, they're these big baddie aliens and you're gonna, you're gonna kill them. My sniper killed all, what, three of the big bad guys in one, sh in one action. <laughs> it was like one <laughs> shot to do this, I had a special ability to take a second shot, then one of the aliens moved and I shot them with another special ability and it was done. It was so <laughs> anticlimactic. I was so, I, I thought I'd broken the game. I was like, what happened? <laughs> um, but no, that's a nice way of, for a, for a combat oriented game like fifth edition, that's a really nice way as well of keeping it from being just literally one shot. I don't mind the one shot when it when it kind of narratively works. I remember I I was trying to do a monster hunt, which I'll talk about in a second, because I think that you can create puzzle monsters that are still satisfying, even if they don't have the Death Star exhaust port, which I love is the modern Achilles heel. It's like, you know, Achilles heel, he's got a Death Star <laughs> exhaust port. Um, you can't my, escape ancient stories! I, I thought it, it you were going to say Achilles heel. Too. Yeah, I know. That's what I thought she was going <laughs> to say. It was Achilles heel and it was a Death heel. Star oh, no. <laughs> exhaust port. Anyway. Well, it's because Achilles heel was a much later myth that did yeah. not exist in Homer's <laughs> Iliad. It, 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 much later in the mythic cycle. <laughs> um... 
<laughs> I uh, I wanted to do a, a cockatrice, uh, and the cockatrice in the monster manual is like a chicken, you know, like it, it's very small. And I wanted the the Witcher three grand draconid style cockatrice monster that you know gurgles cockadoodle do, and everyone's butt blood boils around it, and it was hiding in a tower, and it had killed someone, and the party knew there was some monster in there, and. As they're approaching the tower, it leaps up onto the wall of the tower and outstretches its wings and does this blood-curdling cry and then leaps off the tower and starts to swoop towards the party. I'm like, everyone roll for initiative. And one of the party members was playing a Battlemaster fighter, I think, using a heavy crossbow and just shot it out of the sky, like one shot at it (laughs) as it was swooping towards the party. And I was so mad, but I was like... Yeah, all right. That was pretty cool. Uh, I'll give you that one. That that was pretty, pretty cool. Pretty awesome. I, one thing I do like that you mentioned that that I so I recently participated in um, the Monster Bash, which mm. is uh, something. It was created by. Let me get this right. I think it was four people. It was um, Trent from Miscast, uh, Raquel from Rack Rex Art. I think um, Berserker Works and Nerdcraft HQ were in it. So it's like this thing where they got bored and decided to collaborate on making monsters. They needed inspiration for monsters, so they all drew out different like cards with bits of monsters like a claw or a wing or you know a tail and then they put them into a deck of cards and drew randomly and they had to make a monster from it and most people who are participating in this uh you know modelers and artists who are making these incredible pieces that just they look amazing there's a playlist go look it up but um i was invited to participate which is very nice but i'm i'm not an artist I, I homebrew stuff, so I had to kind of come up with a way to, to do something interesting with that. And uh, blah, 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 long story short, my monster ended up being sort of a combination of a, a pig, a frog, and a chicken. And it was really interesting to me. I was, I was designing it with my Twitch chat, and we were sort of working together and bouncing off each other. And at some point during that, I just started saying, okay, so well, we know that these monster parts are part of it so what do we associate with these creatures and just started making a list and people were surprised that that was my approach but you just said that you know the cockatrice has this you know this crow because Mm. it's related to to the rooster in that way and and i do think that it's it's a great starting point for creating monsters to look at the pieces that you've put together to go, okay, well, it's got part of a frog, so maybe it has a jumping ability. Mm. Okay, well, it's, it's got a pig. What do we associate with pigs? We associate gluttony. We associate devouring things. So I ended up with this monster that had, like, a jumping attack that could swallow people, like the tongue whipped out and grabbed people and swallowed. It was like this whole thing, but it came together because of just looking at these sort of I guess partly physical, but also largely narrative associations with different monster mm. parts. And it, it's tricky to kind of think of how that might work when you're dealing with not straightforward uh, real world animals. I don't know. Is that is that something that you have worked? It's it's just something that comes kind of naturally in my process. Is that something that, that James or Sean do when they're creating monsters? Absolutely. I, I created a bunch of lizard folk monsters based on real world lizards. And so there's the gecko monster, there's the Gila monster, lizard folk. You know, and, and uh, uh, Mackenzie de Armas spoke to my class about creating monsters, and she talked about creating uh, elementals based on the noble gases. I think she did this for Arcadia magazine. And so, you know, it's it's these elementals based on, on the noble gases and their properties. And so you can yeah. get inspiration from a whole bunch of real world uh Real world things, for sure. I I will remember the chlorine elemental that appeared in Order of the Stick, the webcomic, which Burley's webcomic for the rest of my D and D career. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're um, talking. Sorry, go ahead, James. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I um. I I just want to say yes. Yes, I do. Please buy Critical Role Call of the Nether Deep when it comes out on March fifteenth, twenty twenty two. I think, you know, we were talking before about how do you give hints for puzzle monsters, and I think that these, you know, commonly known things or commonly assumed things, if you like, about frogs or whatever the monster is is close to um, helps give those clues about what the monster is all about. As soon as any party member spots web, as soon as you describe any sort of webbing, they're like, oh, it's a type of spider. must be a type of spider. Let's get the insect insecticide out. Um, and I just wanted to say, also with the puzzle monsters, you know, you don't need the, the Death Star exhaust port to make the puzzle monster engaging, I don't think. If you 
show how the monster has killed someone and they're, you know, a medicine check reveals that they've all been poisoned. Now the party know that they need to inure themselves to poison. If you show that the, the monster is knocked through a, a brick wall or something like that, well, they know that the monster is really strong. So grappling it might not be an option. So it doesn't necessarily give them the key to one shot the monster to automatically kill it. Um, if, if, you know, the monster kills someone inside of a locked house with no doors or windows, they know the monster can teleport or, you know, becomes a noxious gas or something like that. So it allows them to gather information that helps them in the fight. That's not necessarily like an automatic win button. This actually is really applicable to dark fantasy, I think, mm. Mm. Uh, given that we're ghost fire and grim hollow is our bread and butter. Um, I think it's worth talking about being able to investigate corpses that have been slain by giant monsters um, mm. because they can really play double duty. Seeing the eviscerated corpses of people who either tried to kill it before you or were just in the wrong place at the wrong time when the horrible thing broke free and went on a rampage, one really raises the uh raises the stakes instantly you know what this thing is capable of and it also provides you with a sort of bit of mechanical knowledge maybe about how to beat it maybe about what it can do to you that can be information enough and and one of the things that i love to do when i was starting to write adventures and it's quite labor intensive uh but but worth it i think is to create you know individualized how did this guy die? Um, little, you know, two sentence snippets that people can get if they perform a wisdom medicine check on a corpse and different kind of corpses. If the monster has different kinds of attacks, this was all inspired by the original Metroid Prime, which I uh, played, I think, right before I started my first D&D campaign. <laughs> because the very first, like the opening hours of that video game take place in this derelict spacecraft where a bunch of space pirates have been performing mutagenic operations on uh, small life forms. And in the very second room, you see the, the hulking corpse of, and you don't know this yet, but it's going to be the same type of creature that you fight as the boss of this area. This gigantic, bloated, acid seeping bug has been brought down by these, like this room full of 30 space pirates, all of whom are dead or who are alive and capable of like aiming a blaster your way and shooting an ineffectual shot before you just like end them. And so you are able to scan and get information on every single one of these corpses talking about like, yeah, it looks like this guy was killed by an acid blast from 30 meters, or this guy's been eviscerated by a giant, you know, spike. And all of these things play into the what's going to happen in the fight of this area. And you can actually not just learn from the uh, fight, but also have a boosty environment mm. as well. I think yeah. with dark fantasy, you can kind of, it's not about giving them the automatic win button, but making it so the monster won't automatically kill them. You know, uh, it's like, how, uh, how can I defend myself to yeah. make this fight possible rather than how can I just destroy the monster? That's it, right? I, one, one thing that I just never shut up about um, is the power of the shorthand. And I think it applies in terms of genre, the genre that you want to play in your game. Um, weirdly, geography a lot of the time comes mm. into it. It's great for lore drops, but monsters as well. Like like Ben was saying just before, you've got this kind of, I don't know, background cultural knowledge that at least in, in sort of English speaking Western countries, we've all got this sort of cultural inheritance that means that we, we read certain uh, encounters in certain ways. Because, you know, I, I for example, um, I did a video on witches, how I would run witches in my game. And in that sort of setup, I talked about making use of things like the players roll up into a town and everyone's freaked out already because, I don't know, children have gone missing or the livestock are dying or whatever. And they're going to they're gonna you know execute this woman because they've decided that she's a witch. And mm. that gives the players a bunch of information because they already know there are witch texts that we all kind of have in the back of our head that tell us, this woman's probably an innocent. She's probably not an evil witch. We should probably save her from this mob of townspeople. Um, it also tells them that somewhere down the line, the townspeople are probably going to go into a panic and, and start rioting or, you know, trying to, to 
find the witches and burn down, the, you know, like there are these certain steps that occur in that story that if you just lean into these, these tropes, these generic tropes, you can be like, here's some information about the monsters. It's definitely a witch because the children are missing and the livestock are dying. <laughs> uh, because it's a witch, there's probably three witches because there's always three <laughs> witches. You know, it's, it's those kinds of things that just give the players information without you having to do a lot of work. So I'm, I'm a big mm. believer in the power of the shorthand. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think and, that. And, uh, sorry, go ahead, Sean. And you can also play against the trope then, because I was going to say the original uh, puzzle monster was the vampire. Although mm. when I think about it, it might be the Hydra. But that's you true. Know, vamp mm. Vampire. Maybe that'll come up in an article. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, uh, so the you know the vampire is one of those things where in the game you want to. Uh, you know, surprise your players, and they're like, well, we have garlic, we have the wooden stake, we have these spells, we have the holy water. Oh, we'll just follow the mist back to its lair. Okay, it's stunned in its coffin, and boom, it's dead. So what we did with the Grim Hollow uh, monster book was we gave you several kinds of vampires. Mm. So your players may not know how to deal with an ogresh vampire as opposed to a human vampire. Oh, yeah. And I also like that it, it has almost this rumor element to it, right? Like, oh, well, mm -hmm. people say that this is strong against vampires, but that doesn't mean it's strong against this vampire. That sort of right. a thing, you know? Mm. And it, it does. It plays with people's expectations. I um just to get a little bit pretentious again. There's a medievalist scholar whose name is Hans Jaus, Um, And he, he talks about, um, specifically he's talking about uh, tropes that appear in um, sort of Shakespearean um, sort of early modern theater. But he's talking about the, the idea that the pleasure of those plays was derived from it being a story that the audience were all familiar with. It's not, it's not fresh. They've, it's not like they've never heard it before. Of course they've heard this story, but it has new elements to it. It twists some things. It does some unexpected things. It's, it's, he calls it something like, um, the pleasure of an ongoing game with known rules and still unexpected surprises. And it, it's mm. sort of this double pleasure that you're like, oh, I know this story. Oh, that's different you know it's the same thing that we get from from fan fiction that uses the same trope over and over again but just a little bit different just a little bit different well speaking of playing with no rules uh let us transition into our second topic which i'm almost loath to do to be honest because i could pick all three of your brains about monsters uh for the rest of the day but we must uh, villainously proceed uh, to the second topic question, which was something that was uh, triggered in my mind. Um, Celeste Conowich did a series of blog articles for the Ghostfire Gaming blog about how Ooh. to run uh, an evil campaign. And I love the idea of running an evil campaign. I think more campaigns are evil campaigns without realizing it. Um, when you, all three of you before were like, oh, my characters have only been virtuous. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what every player I thinks. never said that. I never said I was virtuous. I said I was medium. <laughs> Um, so I guess I, I thought I would just gauge your approaches to, to running an evil campaign, uh, knowing that it's a campaign that, that is fraught with uh, potential disaster for a couple of reasons, you know. It can just, like the whole game can just crash and break because the players... You, the, there's a difference from me, uh, and Celeste talks about this in her blogs, uh, between running a, an evil campaign and a murder hobo campaign. There's a difference between being like evil and wanting something and just killing everyone on sight. Um, Sean, you said before you've never played in one of these before. Would you be interested in playing or running one or it just doesn't hold that much allure for you? I, I, over my many, many years of playing and running games, I have definitely run evil focus campaigns. Uh, and they're not a problem as long as they're not disruptive campaigns. Sure. And I think that's the issue because you can have players playing all paladins and still have a very disruptive campaign. Uh, so it's, it's more about everyone agreeing to the boundaries before you start. Mm. It, your, your evil campaign shouldn't be much different than your regular campaign, assuming you don't run evil campaigns every <laughs> campaign. But your, your characters should still have goals. They should still have traits and bonds and flaws and all of those things. And they should all still be working toward the same narrative goals of everyone having a good time. Mm. And as long as those things are all happening... Evil campaigns, 
I think are fine. Uh, are they often taken too far? Absolutely. Um, often because players think that freeing themselves from the ethics or the morals of their of society will th- therefore make an interesting campaign. And evil isn't necessarily more interesting than good. Uh, and oftentimes it's less interesting when it's just destruction. As you said, you know, murder hobo. So, you know, all of those things go, I think, together into making it possibly problematic, but any campaign can be problematic if there is an element of disruption that's constantly being injected into it. Mm. Do you, can you think of a successful evil campaign that you've run that really sticks in your mind and why, why it was enjoyable for everyone involved? I ran a sort of Robin Hood campaign where King Richard went off to fight in the Crusades and the evil King John stayed home and took over. And the players were sort of on King John's side. Uh, (laughs) And Ah. they were keeping King Richard from returning. Uh, And they all had the greed was was. uh, was a motive and power was a a motive, but they were still always working together. And, and what I would do is I would set up ways that they could be evil while still advancing the story. Mm -hmm. So I set up situations where they could use tactics that they might otherwise not use if they were playing good characters and still succeed in a way that the group succeeded, not just the individual characters and their goals were met not only because they did well, but because they did evil. Mm. <laughs> and, and so, you know, th- if you can set that up and everyone's on the same page, it can be a very fun and different sort of campaign. Were they chasing Robin Hood through when you say it was a Robin Hood like campaign? Because I'm just imagining, you know, along the lines of what I just said. Burn Sherwood sure... Forest to the ground. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Flush him out. Well, a lot of like, you know, a bandit is a pretty standard D and D villain as a trope. I'm sure those bandits all consider themselves Robin Hoods or many of them in their in their own right. Sure, but it, you know, in the case of in the case what I did was I made the society evil in which that these characters were a cog. Sure. So they they were trying, rather than trying to break the status quo, they were trying to maintain the status quo. It just happened to be an evil status quo. James, and have you that, ever run... Oh, that sorry. Them in. Uh, and that reined them in. James, have you ever run or been part of a campaign on the more villainous side? No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to the idea. Um, I think I think the idea of playing a, an evil campaign is a really interesting one. But it has to be a very sort of... I, I, I think for me and for the, uh, the, the people that I play with, it would have to be something really kind of uh, over-the-top, super villainous, Batman villain sure. sort of thing. Because, like, we're... we're Man, we're just so fed up about all the evil crap in the world anyway. It's like if we have to think about our guys, you know, you know, propping up corrupt leaders or, you know, going on uh, going on wars and stealing from those who have nothing. We're like, do we I'm not having fun with this. But if we get to be big, colorful, you know, uh, themed villains who just do the most ridiculous plots to rob a bank or, you know, go full 60s Batman cheese, uh, I think I would just have an absolute blast with that. Yeah, I... I... I don't know if I agree personally for myself in terms of the the full Batman cheese because I, I think you're right. I think playing evil campaigns can be exhausting if um, you're already exhausted by everything. Yeah, that's and going like on. it's 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 fine that you disagree with that. I, I I just you know you wouldn't play in that campaign with me. <laughs> it's but the thing. Have you yeah. ever have you ever run like morally gray campaigns? I suppose because like oh, yeah. give quick example oh, yeah, is yeah 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 yeah. yeah. 
the the players that I'm playing with at the moment, I'm just running a small. It started in lockdown, so it was just my housemate and my partner. Um, so two player campaign, and they ended up on the run from the Arcanist Inquisition because one of them was a spellcaster, and they came across a trader who was going to sell them supplies that they couldn't afford. Uh, and also discovered that one of them was a spellcaster and the trader started to panic. So they burnt the trader to a crisp, shut the the caravan and slapped the horse and the horse just went running off in the woods in a random direction. And they looked at each other and were like, I guess this is the campaign we're playing now. We're officially <laughs> yeah. playing an evil campaign. Yeah, I was like, I guess thing. so. I, I like morally dirty characters i like characters who have just rolled in the mud of of immorality um i think they're really fun and you know because because i'm a person who knows myself and i play with people who know themselves we know that those people aren't us Mm. and it's like oh i'm not you know i'm not feeling judged by my friends by playing an absolute bastard or i'm not judging them because they think that you know murder is okay as long as the ends justify the means, you know, sure. like it's, it's fine. There's just sort of like, uh, there it's, I, I, the thing that gets to me, I think is the, the idea of the evil campaign, right? We're, we're telling an overall sort of evil story where mm. evil will triumph over goodness. And I'm, and, and that's just not what I'm interested in, in telling. Gotcha. Yeah, I kind of get that. I feel like for me, it harks back a little bit to our alignment discussion, that idea of uh. I, I don't really want to play in a game where the broader trajectory is evil, but I'm fine if it's like a character's personal journey is is selfish mm. or, or wicked. You know, I, I'm, I don't mind that so much as long as it's not like overarching baddiness um, that, yeah. that maybe would... I mean, I suppose the other things that spring to my mind, I've never run an evil campaign. Um, I've never really had players who were interested in playing evil characters, but the, the sort of two things that spring to mind is that I would really need player buy-in out the wazoo. Like, I'm not mm. just talking about people who are like, yeah, okay, I'll play an evil... I need, I need people to be excited about it because otherwise I feel like that you could run into issues of... of potential you know hurt feelings or whatnot um you know you you want people to buy into it the way they buy into among us you know my friends are gonna murder me and i'm gonna be excited about it um you know that kind of a buy-in and the other thing that kind of comes to mind is i don't think that i would be able to sustain it for a very long campaign i think it would have Mm. to be quite a short campaign or else maybe if an evil character was in a longer campaign, have it be mostly sort of downtime activity. So it's not necessarily sure. tied into their shared goals with the other party members. I don't know. It's it's all very theoretical for me since I haven't done it. I guess you're right though. Like I haven't run, like I haven't sat down with a group of players and been like, now we're going to run an evil campaign. And I think that, yeah, exactly. There's lightning behind me when it happens. And I think maybe that's the the misnomer that I've brought into this conversation is phrasing it that way, is being like, would you run an evil campaign when... I have heard people do that all the time. I have heard yeah. people talk about, I will run an evil campaign. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think there's yeah. a difference between what, what James and Dale, you were talking about in terms of like a morally grey campaign or a campaign where the party do questionable dirty things for their own goals for the safety of others for whatever it happens to be because this is you know this is the thing that i was joking about earlier on is that often players assume that they are the good guys by virtue of the fact that they are playing the campaign Mm. and i think i've told i think i told in in that episode where we were talking about alignment the story of how one of my friends hand shook a goblin in a in a good faith deal what turned out to be a bad faith deal and cast uh, inflict wounds and just melted the goblin there and then. And I, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, that is so evil. Like, that is that is completely deceptive. But uh, I guess, you know, I guess if you're going to run the, I don't know what thesis point I'm coming here to, I guess if you're going to run the evil campaign, maybe you're right, James, it does need to be a bit more, um, you know, super uh, Batman, super villain, uh, kind of rather than than trying to be just as vile as you can be, because that's you're right, probably not fun. Just if that's the aim of the campaign, I I think that the the word needs to be is a dangerous one to apply here, because sure. for me, yes, that's true. 
for me, if I were to play or run that campaign, that would need to be true. But I, I, I wouldn't want to make a blanket statement like that for everyone. I think sure. there are people who would find a great amount of catharsis of, of you know, suddenly being the truly despicable bad guy. Like, it, it, it is very fun, I think, for actors to play terrible people because you get to inhabit the mind of, of someone who is just so completely different from your day-to-day -day point of view. It's such a departure. It, I mean, it, it's a really huge exercise in role-playing to mm -hmm. play someone like that and then take them off entirely and go on with your life afterwards. And, and not just for role-playing, but to go back to first edition, uh, alignment and evil mechanically mattered. Mm. There are certain classes you couldn't play unless you were evil. So, you know, in order to, and when I did run the evil campaign, it was during first edition. And part of the reason was to engage that sort of section of the rules, right? You couldn't be good and use poison or your alignment would change. Well, what if you wanted to use poison? Uh, so let's make a campaign where you can make use of poison and it's not automatically changing your character's alignment and, and messing up with th their gods or your paladinhood or, or, or what have you in the rules. I, I'm curious to... I wonder how that would fit in with this sort of uh, modern era of very narratively focused um, RPG sort of structures. Um, because, I mean, there's there's some of my sort of fundamental uh, understanding of fantasy came from uh, Fable the Lost Chapters as a video game. Um, and then I, it's sort of been implemented in um, the Marvel Ultimate role-playing game as well, a little bit, this idea of crossroads, these choices that you have to make. And I suppose it's uh, obviously in games like Dragon Age as well, where it's like, you have to make a choice here. And one of these choices is going to lead you down a darker path. <laughs> and mm. one of them is going to lead you down a brighter path. And it makes me think of um, the one the one game that I'm a player in at the moment. Ooh, la la. Um, I, I made a character. This is story time with Dale. Um, I made a character who was like, the concept was there was a chosen one prophecy. And uh, she was like the child of the prophecy. And she was raised to be this hero. And then when she was like 14 years old, they realized that they got the wrong kid. And so she was just kind of <laughs> dumped and thrown aside. And they were like, sorry, mistake. Um, and they, they got the right kid and they started training him instead. So she's like, I call her the Fosen one because um, Fos <laughs> chosen. Um, anyway, but I recently was reading back the prophecy that I had written up in her backstory and looking at the clues of like this ultimate evil that, uh, that she was raised to defend the city against. I was like, this could be her. Like she could come back mad at, at how they treated her and be the bad guy. And I don't know if that's going to happen. I'm not like angling for that to happen, but I did sort of have this, this realization that there could be this crossroads down the line where it's like, am I going to be good or am I going to be evil? And I would love that, that concept thrills me. The idea of putting these choices in front of the players and being like, well, what path are you going to take? And and so many factors fall into that. The, the experiences they've had in the game, the experiences they've had in their backstory, where they are right in the moment that they have to make that choice. That's fascinating to me. They all that is so a perfect juicy. example. <laughs> yeah, a perfect example of self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm going to steal that right? story. That's wonderful. <laughs> Dale, you I mean, have to do this. I know. Yeah. Oh. You can't not do this. <laughs> Well, this, it's funny that you, you say that because um, it ties into an email that we got, which uh, at the moment we probably don't have time to disseminate the whole email um, from Nathan, who was talking about basically like influences from video games that we've drawn into our, our tabletop RPGs, um, which is a whole discussion unto itself. And he does mention, Dale, that you've done a few videos on that. Um, but the, the example that they used from their game was that they created a sort of loose light side, dark side mechanic like what's in Mass Effect or Knights of the Old Republic that could change alignment based on player actions. And they don't elaborate how this system worked, but it also kind of reminded me, James, when you touched on the reputation system that you had been working on um, and whether, you know, we talked about it uh, with Logan a little bit, you know, whether certain weapons become available to you or are shut off from you because of your alignment. What if, you know, you tweaked the campaign so that the more evil actions that were taken, 
the party heard about poison sellers. Um, but if they were, you know, it's not a, it's not an incapability to use poison, but it's just more avenues become accessible to you if you move down a darker path and different avenues become accessible to you if you move down a lighter path. If your reputation is that you are too, you know, evil or, or self-interested, the the local temple refuses to heal you or, or resurrect anybody from the party. Um, you know, you could you could tweak with it that way as well. Make the game world react to to the choices that you make. It's a really cool idea. Um, I think it's a really, really tempting idea. Too tempting. Um, I think it's a very mechanically involved idea. Mm. I think it's one that will put a lot of pressure on the DM to follow by their own rules. Uh, mm. And ultimately, I think, come up with a worse result than if they had just kind of played it by feel. Um, and I, you can you can use kind of like a, a, a rough tally. How, how evil is the party being? How lawful is the party being? But... I, I always worry that this is a, such an awesome sort of systemic idea that would work pretty okay in a video game, but you're a human being, not a computer. Yeah. You can find more natural ways of doing this. Are there, are there for Sean and actually for all three of you, I mean, I know it's going to be The Witcher for Ben, but like, are there, <laughs> are there games that are your touchstone games that you pull influ influence from? Oh, yeah. I'm the, gonna. The answer I'm, is, I'm gonna yeah, go, go ahead, and, and let and let James think. <laughs> so, part of the uh, problem that I have with role playing games and role uh, video games is that I was playing role playing games before there were video games. Mm. So, unless I'm taking my cues from Space Invaders or Pong, uh, I was really steeped in the storytelling at the table before I was even considering uh video games as a medium for anything i think when i first saw baldur's gate uh, that showed me different ways that you can tell stories within a role-playing game you could pull that from the video game and use it at the table and so it did start making me think differently of how to tell a story sort of bringing a uh, choose your own adventure sort of thing to a role-playing game and make it work or use that structure to help structure a game so that would be the the one that i think back on i think i think my video game reference uh uh not references but my video game sort of like background has informed the types of games I like to run. Um, I'm a big fan of The Legend of Zelda uh, for its dungeon exploring adventure. I'm a big fan of Fire Emblem for its tactical gameplay. I'm a big fan of Metroid for its interweaving, fascinating worlds and its lock and key structures. But I don't think I ever try to like ape any one of those games. Um, I, I think there are little sort of fragments of them. Like, you know, if you're a musician, you listen to as much music as you can. The music that you like, uh, you don't copy it necessarily, unless you're, you know, doing a cover or something like that. But uh, those sort of broad styles kind of form a bedrock just of your own preferences and the sort of language that you create art in. Mm. Um, so I... I guess I would say that my, my games do feature a lot of interwoven dungeon environments where exploration is a big deal. There are a lot of challenges that span beyond just the room that you're in. There are tactical challenges that involve positioning and teamwork. Uh, but I, I think rare is the day these days when I think, okay, how can I make a Zelda-style dungeon or something like that? I think the the one touchstone that I would that I stole something from pretty whole cloth um, that wasn't The Witcher um, <laughs> was Red Dead Redemption Two had the caravan, and I just loved that idea of like a, the party being part of a roving caravan. So we did a session zero where it was uh, I was like, don't think about what your class is, you know, don't think of yourself as a fighter or a wizard. Think about what your job in the caravan is. 
are you responsible for corralling, you know, mm. all the people that, you know, all the people that kind of need help? So maybe you're a bard because you're you're good at helping the young'uns and the old'uns into their their caravans. Are you responsible for security? That might make you a fighter. Are you uh, an entertainer? Are you responsible for manufacturing things or trading? Do you go into the village and trade? Whatever whatever it happened to be. But the intention was that basically this was a moving village that would move with the party so that wherever they would go, they would always have access to some level of resources and that the caravan had like gold associated with it. There was like a level of wealth that the caravan had and every day it would like subtract um, an amount from that. And if that amount was too low, then the resources the caravan offered the party was restricted. But if it was really high, then they could offer them greater resources. So it kind of became a mechanic that the party had to keep giving to the caravan uh, as well as taking from it. So they had their own little localized economy. And I just thought that was cool. So I stole it. Um, yeah. Dale, yeah. what about you? What's your, your – because uh, I know there's a lot for you, but yeah. if you had to pick one. If I had to pick one, it might be Fable the Lost Chapters. I think Fable um, really – influenced the kind of villains that I like to run. And I mean that in terms of both, you know, monsters, sort of lieutenant mini bosses, big bosses. Mm. You know, Jack of Blades mm. is such such a ridiculously mm. good villainous character. Yeah. Um, but on top of that, you've got all these weird little things like, you know, you escape the prison and now you have to fight a kraken. Um, but they they kind of, like I was saying before, there's this coherency to um, to these sort of sections of the adventure that um, really resonated with me. Things like the White Balverine. It's so good. It's just got such juicy, meaty um, sort of arcs for the characters uh, and for the bad guys that I really, even if I don't literally pull from, um, I, I think structurally is a, is a strong touchstone for me. Mm. Well, we will round it out there. That is a podcast. That is the podcast, the Eldritch Lawcast, your new favourite D&D podcast. Thank you so much, James Hake, Dale Kingsmill, Sean Merwin, for joining me. I've been Ben Byrne. If you want to keep the conversation going, our Twitter handles are just below our names, so you can reach out to us there if you like. If you're not watching this on YouTube, you can send an email like Nathan did to podcast at ghostfiregaming.com and I pick out usually one of those an episode to read out uh, so that we can disseminate and go through all the juicy parts of the email uh, among the hosts here. Uh, make sure to go to your guild of adventurers. Let them know about the Eldritch Lawcast. Subscribe to us on your platform of choice and we will see you all next week. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye.